Hello, everyone. Thanks for choosing to join this talk. Uh, I'm Nikhil. I work at Airbnb for the machine learning infrastructure team. And I work on this particular thing called Zipline, which is a feature engineering framework for declaratively generating features. So we will, that's a lot of big words. We'll unpack that slowly throughout the presentation. So a little bit of a context before we jump into the problem statement here. We'll wait for the new people to settle down. So what I'm going to present here is not just my work, unlike many of the other talks. It's a work of a lot of other engineers who build this thing called Big Head, which is an end-to-end -end machine learning platform. And this is in the context of supervised machine learning, which means you're training over data which already has labels. Oops. Right. And we are going to talk about specifically structured data, not unstructured data. What I mean by that is the kind of data that lives in databases and flows through logs, not audio or text or media. Right. And most of this talk is going to be about uh, an algorithm for efficiently generating features. Right. So let's zoom out a little bit and look at how supervising, supervised machine learning is done today in the industry. So a data scientist starts with a problem, right? And then he explores data that is available to him within the company, right? The databases, the service logs, the data lakes, whatnot. Goes about creating a feature or set of features that he can use to train a model. And he keeps doing this in a loop until the model is deemed good enough, right? And once it's deemed good enough, uh, the data scientist try to, tries to productionize this and wire it up to an application server. So I have been using data scientist as a singular term here, but usually this is teams of people with different kinds of skill sets. So the first set of skills is data engineering, like creating the pipelines that is necessary to generate features. And the data scientist, which is the fancy ML PhD who goes about training the model with the newest algorithm. And the next set of people who take this to production are what in industry are called machine learning engineers. But in reality, they are systems engineers. And I think machine learning engineers as a fancy marketing term to you know, hire more people. Well, so we just looked at the flow. And I think there is more to machine learning in industry than just the modeling part itself. So by some accounts, about 5% of what you actually do is going to be core machine learning, the math. And about 95%, or at least 95%, is the actual systems engineering that is required to put together a model in production. Right, this is from a paper by Scully in NIPS. So what's the goal of Big Head here? The goal is, can we eliminate the glue code or automate it somehow and allow for a single data scientist to be able to take a machine learning model into production? Right. So this is a fairly imperative process in the sense that you need to basically spell out what you need to do throughout the workflow instead of declaring a specification. So to really enable a data scientist to uh, take an idea into production, this needs to be declarative to some extent, in the sense that the data scientist needs to be able to say, this is what needs to be done instead of how to do it. We will see more details about that later. And this is also very expensive, in the sense that all this gluing together is what makes this whole project take about six months to in a year instead of days. The declaration in the data scientist's head is fairly small, actually. Right. So there is another problem here, which is the coupling with the application servers. So there is a subtle difference from the last set of images to this one, which basically the difference here is that there is this new thing called key that is flowing between feature serving and application serving. So Let's say you're trying to predict weather in St. Louis, right? 
The question here is really simple, and the question doesn't really care about the signals that go into predicting weather, right? So in this case, the key is the city or St. Louis in itself. So the idea here is that we want to minimize the surface of contracts between applications and the machine learning system, right? Now, this is the broader context. Let's jump into feature engineering. So a big part of uh, the time that is spent in a machine learning project is feature engineering, or converting your raw data into meaningful features. And by our accounts, or by our analysis, it's 60 to 70%. And this is really important because there is a saying which basically goes like, a good data with an OK model always beats a fancy model with mediocre data. I don't have much proof to back, back that 60 to 70% number up, except for this one question from the Google machine learning course, which basically says you spend more than half your time doing feature engineering for machine learning. All right, so what makes this take so long, and why is this process so hard? And why is this so dreaded by data scientists? And why does no one want to do it? So I think the real thing that academia doesn't deal with is that everything in this workflow keeps changing. And in the sense that features and the feature declarations themselves and the algorithm that is used to train the model keeps changing. And as the world changes, you see more data. So if users are taking actions on your application or if there is new sensor data that is flowing through your sensors, there will be new data, and your model needs to incorporate the understanding of the new world. Right? So this is good. It helps your model be performant, but dealing with change is really, really hard. So there are two problems really here. The first problem is a release engineering problem. So usually, when you talk about release engineering, you generally think about a first order function. So what I mean by that is you're taking a, a function that is written by application developers to handle data and convert that into actions. But machine learning is a bit peculiar in the sense that it is an algorithm that is actually generating a function, which is a first order function. So it's consuming labeled data and generating a function which takes unlabeled data and makes predictions. This talk is not going to be about this for the rest of the presentation. We'll jump into the second problem, which is dealing with uh, changing data. So first, an example. I choose a problem that I can easily solve, uh, or I have the intuition, which is predicting if you're going to get Indian food tonight. Right? One of the intuitions is that hot weather and hot food don't go well together. So maybe uh, the average temperature between now and before dinner is a signal. Right. And, or maybe people who are uh, into Indian food behave a little bit like addicts in the sense that it's a habit, it's a behavior. So maybe we can look at the signal that how many times did you have Indian food last year. Or maybe you're new, you haven't tried Indian food yet, but if you're already tolerant to spicy or if you have certain masochistic tendencies, you're uh, willing to give Indian food a shot. So maybe one of the other signals is uh, the amount of spice you can tolerate, or the spiciest food you have had in the last year. Right. So all these features that I described here change with time. So if I were to put this in a timeline, I'm trying to predict whether you're going to have Indian food now. And at some point in the future, at 8 o'clock maybe, I will see a label, whether you had an Indian you had Indian food for dinner or not. So, and the feature values also keep changing throughout this time, right? Now, the first set of things we need to look at here is what are the freshest features available? What I mean by that is you don't want to pick feature values from the future or from the right side of this dotted line because you know your model is going to perform really well when you train it, but in production, it won't materialize. And you don't want these feature values to be far towards the left either, which means you're training over stale data. Right? So you want them to be as precise as po possible, but no more precise. 
right? Similarly, if you have a sec if you try to make a prediction at a later point in time, maybe in an hour, where you have thought sufficiently about Indian food and made up your mind to actually have it, there's going to be a second set of features and a second row for training your data, a second row of training data. Right now, if you look at this problem closely, right, this is some sort of a join, a time series join specifically, right, and a time series join over aggregating data, which is the feature definitions that we saw before. Now, before we jump into the algorithm itself, let's take a step back and uh, understand a few properties about aggregations. Right, so aggregation math is basically math about math. Let's take a simple example to start with, a sum. A sum is what's called commutative in the sense that you can sum over any order of the elements, right? So what this means is you don't have to use an expensive sorting step before you aggregate your data. And the other property is that it is associative, so you can arbitrarily split your data across nodes and combine the sums together later. The other property is reversibility, which means you can reverse data off of aggregations. It's not very intuitive why this would be useful, but we'll see shortly throughout the presentation. And this makes some what's called an abelian group. There are other properties, but they're not of interest for this uh, presentation. Now, a question to the audience. Uh, how many of you think that average also has the same properties? How many of you think it doesn't? All right, so there is a not very clever trick, which is uh, changing the data itself that you operate on to make this an abelian group, which basically means you factor the aggregate into sum and count, and then aggregate over that instead of maintaining the average itself, and you finalize with a division, All right? So you can lift an average into something that's an abelian group with reversibility, right? So by our definition, an aggregation is something that has an IR, which is bounded in terms of memory. Or you can keep the entire history of events that happen, which will grow unboundedly, but it won't yield towards optimization. And there are two classes of aggregations. The first class is what we just discussed, some average and count. And then there is another class of aggregations, which is minimum, maximum, a few sketches that counts different other metrics. So there is a very subtle difference between these two. Remember that I said uh, reversibility is important. And reversibility is what distinguishes these two classes of operations. Right? I'm going to refer to these things as uh, groups and non-groups from now on, which is mathematically incorrect. But you know, for the sake of the presentation, just uh, bear with me. Now, let's say you're trying to compute windows over grouped operations. As you're sliding your window, you have a current value of the number of times you visited Indian restaurants in the last year. So if you're trying to compute the same thing for the next day, right, you can basically uh, add what entered the window and remove what left the window. When I say remove, this is the reversibility. Right, and use that to produce the next value. So instead of looking at all events in the window, you can just look at the head and the tail. So you can create the next value in constant time. Right. Now let's say you're trying to compute the other feature, which is what is your spice tolerance or what is the spiciest food you have had in the last month. So let's say the green bar over there is what spans the window that you're trying to consider, and clearly four is the maximum here. Now, if you're trying to compute the same feature the next day, right, four just left the window. So to recompute what is the maximum in the window, you have to go over all the elements in the window. That's, that's a naive algorithm, right? But you're essentially aggregating over roughly the same set of elements. So maybe there is something you can do to cleverly optimize this uh, sliding. So what we are saying here is that we're going to break this problem down into uh, sub-problems that are represented by a binary roll-up. So you're going to aggregate uh, data from adjacent nodes all the way until it's just one. 
So the reason for doing that is that now you no longer have to look at the, all the leaf nodes. You can just look at the nodes that span the window. Right? So this makes the whole thing tractable. So let's say you have a million events in the window. Right? Naively, you would have to scan million events. But with this, you can basically scan about 14 events. Right? And that's, about, that's a huge reduction in the amount of time it takes to compute aggregates. Now, the time complexity really here is quadratic versus you know, logarithmic. And the space, so we are trading off space for this. We are actually spending more memory to get the speed up. And this is just a narrow application of aggregation in the sense that only windowed non-groups are what actually need these tree trick. Everything else can be accumulated or done the first approach. Now, this really is a tiling problem. So you're trying to tile the window with the nodes that span the window. Right? Remember the three nodes that we selected? So there is some logic that goes into selecting those. And that can be done recursively by finding a split point that is aligned to the powers of two and recursively going left and right. But we chose uh, the binary tree for a reason because this is uh, amenable to bit manipulation. So you can find the split point as a closed form equation. And you can, f so there is a proof that basically says the tiling is bi the binary representation of the distance of the right and the left boundaries to the split point. So this is all very hand wavy. We are going to write a paper, and it will be less hand wavy in the paper. But so there is another reason why reversibility matters. So let's say you're dealing with change data. Change data is data that comes from uh, database operations. So inserts, deletes, and updates. So inserts are easier to deal with, but a deletion is a reversal. right? And an update is nothing but a deletion followed by an insertion. So deletion of the old value followed by an insertion of a new value. So Let's take the third example, which is, let's say suddenly there is a heat wave forecast at 7 PM. So this will change the probability with which you will uh, you know, choose Indian food over other food. Right? So in this case, you want to update and aggregate. So reverse out the last forecast and update the next one. So concretely, you have a log of queries. So you have a user. You have a time at which you want to predict certain features about the uh, certain uh, attributes about the user. And you have features that are aggregates that need to be joined together with the time property, in the sense that the features are uh, not too stale and not from the future. Right. So this is the temporal join or the time series join that we are talking about. And if you see, the left side is the query log, the right side is the raw data, and the output is a joint thing. And the key observation here is that with those properties that we discussed about aggregations before, you can do all of this in a single pass. Right? So you can basically fuse the join and the aggregation together. Right? And another observation here is that raw data is much, much larger than the query log itself. So you would never train over billions of events. You would probably train over hundreds of thousands or even millions. But raw data can go up to trillions of events. Now, this is the tree merge again. It's a subtle difference from what we already saw. So these are the timestamps that uh, you're trying to generate the features for. And a new event comes in. So this event is going to affect certain queries from the future. So if an event happens right now, if I visit Indian Food Place right now, I'm going to increment the count for the window of queries that happen over the next year or the next month. Right? So when this comes in, I'm just going to figure out which nodes to update instead of all the queries in the window and update just those. And at the end of the algorithm, collapse all of these events into timestamps. So this is what makes this algorithm tractable from quadratic. So a little bit about the query topology itself. You have the query log, and you group by. So the group by here is a sort of compression of the data that you're going to uh, 
utilize for aggregation. So what I mean by that is you're going to broadcast the smaller data to the raw data, because raw data is larger and you don't want to move that. So from there on, you apply the tree trick to compute the partial aggregates, and then you explode them out across different machines. By this point, the cardinality of, this, of the things that you're trying to compute is reduced from the size of raw data to the size of query log. Right? Now you shuffle and merge them. So at this point, it's much cheaper to move data. So there are clearly like three logical stages, which is compressing the data and broadcasting it, then joining and aggregating at the same time, and then shuffling it to the next stage. Right. So we are exploiting all the three intuitions here, which is you can split uh, aggregations arbitrarily and the size disparity between query and the raw data. Now, there are several nuances to this thing. So when we use timestamp, it's not just a single timestamp. Usually, there are two timestamps, the time at which your system saw the event and the time that is contained in the event itself. Let's say I tried to. Uh, predict or uh, compute the number of people who were born in the last 30 days, right? As a new user, I just signed up, right? So my event time is going to be my birth date, but my ingestion time is going to be today, right? And the tree handles this queue, but you can be more efficient if you can use the assumption that event time and ingestion time are the same, right? And there are many sources of raw data. We just discussed a single join, but you can join all of uh, all different sources at once. More in paper, obviously. Right. And the next thing we will look at is the feature serving stack. Right. Now we have computed features that are point in time correct. So in some sense they are offline, but you know real time, according to the query. So there are several considerations for feature serving. The first one is latency. You want to optimize wherever you're going to put these features for point queries. So you want to get the features of a particular key really quickly. And you want to uh, consider two things, which is data freshness, is, which basically means how recently have you written the data, and latency. Latency is how quickly can you read your data. Now. Remember we talked about change data. Change data is, so the way we have built it is as a Lambda architecture. And Lambda architecture means that we use a little bit of batch processing and stream processing to produce aggregates. We haven't done Kappa for one reason. Kappa is basically using just streaming events to produce um, feature aggregates. What prevents us from doing that is uh, the fact that there, we are handling change data. Change data has deletions, right? And if you cannot handle deletes in real time, you will need to somehow correct from time to time. Right? And that's where batch correction comes into play here. So the architecture, uh, so what we have looked at so far is how we go from feature declaration to a feature backfill, which feeds into uh, model training. Right. Now the next part is going to be about creating uh, the serving store or the feature store. So we compute some batch aggregates and some streaming updates to it and put together both the updates in a feature store. Right. And this all comes together in a model server. So there is a model server that you know, has a feature client that talks to the model and spits out predictions. Now this is all happening in Big Head. And what users see is just the endpoint that talks to the application server. And this is what I mean by declaration. So there is just one declaration or a few declarations that produce these pipelines for all the users across the companies, and they can just embed the endpoints in the application server. Right. So we're going to talk about how the data is laid out within uh, the storage. So what we do here is the, the head of the events is basically all streaming, and the tail is coming from batch computation. So let's say you're trying to 
compute 30 day window. The blue boxes, the first two block blue boxes are coming from batch. And the green box is being updated in real time through streaming. And at the end, the client is going to put all of this together. So the blue boxes are of different colors for a particular reason. So as you slide your window, you want the 30 day window accuracy. Right? So what this means is that you cannot store a collapsed partial aggregate in the tail of your window. But there is a problem with this. So every day you have to keep uploading uh, batches of the tails of the window. Now, the problem is if you want to keep this available as you compute new batch, right? you are going to have to wait. And that uh, reduces the availability of features. What we just do is like add a buffer in the tail of raw events, which is the light blue box. And the 29 days in between is what's collapsed into a single value. And the green thing is also a single value. So as you slide to the next day, you still have some buffer so that you can keep this system available for the next day. So one consideration here is that the tail can be pretty large. But since these are uh, values that can be arbitrarily aggregated, you can reduce the resolution by collapsing them into 15-minute buckets if you choose to when the data is pretty large. Now, before we talk about the API that or the declarations that produce all of this, let's talk a little bit about typical data architecture in a company so that the API makes more sense. So you start with a service fleet that is talking to a production database. Right? This is what uh, an application stack kind of looks like, very simplified. And you create a message bus that is the event stream that is flowing through the services, which becomes an event log in the data lake that you can access at a later point in time. And similarly, with the changes to production databases, you have a change capture stream that you can read and aggregate over. And a mirror of this will be the change capture log. So imagine you took the bin logs from your database and dumped it into a data lake and partitioned it by day. Right? There is one more kind of data, which is the database snapshot itself. So typically, you use tools like Scoop or whatever to produce snapshots at a certain rate within your data lakes. Right? And then there is external data, derived data, and then there is media. So there are two classes of data here. The first one is events, and the second one is st state. Right? So the difference here is that uh, at every point in time, you have an understanding of what the state of the world is. And the way in which you see changes are through pairs of before and after uh, values of the state as changes happen. Right? So there are two groups of data here, really. And then there is derived data, which is easier to deal with. So we don't uh, talk much about aggregating over derived data. And as I said earlier, we are only considering structured data, so no media. So there are several types of data. And so far, when uh, you interact with a feature engineering system, right, these types of data aren't exposed. These are somehow implicit in people's minds, and they use that uh, to imperatively say how to scan the data. So what we are saying is uh, actually force users to classify what is the kind of underlying data whether it is entity snapshots like database changes or whatever, and entity mutations, so which is basically events. Right? So you can put together the database snapshots and mutations to achieve point-in-time correctness instead of scanning the entire bin log across history. Right? And the idea here is that we want to encode the understanding of the users about how data is stored into the API. And this helps us to scan windows differently. So here is a quick example of how this API looks like. So you're giving a query which selects the data that you want to scan. And then you define the operations that you want to do over the scanned data. 
right? And you can specify windows and you can specify the operation type and more. There is bucketing and whatever, but we won't talk about that. So next thing that's very important here is that you specify what is the key. So who is this person I'm uh, predicting whether he will have Indian food or not? And what is the timestamp at which I'm making this prediction? Right? Time is essential to all of Zipline, so this is a must-have feature of the data sources. Now, to remind you, so this is what the query log looks like, and user is the key here, and timestamp is what's also selected in the query there, and then there are the aggregated features. Right Now, you go from that definition of an aggregation to a training set by declaring what your features are. So you can refer to them directly, and you can select uh, what are the queries that you're joining against. Right. So that's basically my talk. And there are links of the images that I posted before, which is you know, proof that 95% uh, of the code is glue code and 50% or more is feature engineering. So thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'll take questions if you have any. There. Yeah, so we use snapshots and the bin logs for just that day to achieve you know point in time correctness for midday, let's say. So we try to keep the head of the window real time, so there is no need for hourly aggregation there. But the tails are what is reduced resolution. So when I said 15 minute buckets, if you have a lot of data in the tail, you want to bound it by aggregating that into. Okay, so why can you do it it's configurable. It's just an example. And what is the smallest? So the smallest increment is infinitesimal, so you can basically keep all the raw data to achieve exact accuracy. But if you're okay with approximations, you can slide over you know, hops of 15 minutes. I'll take the question from the gentleman in the black shirt. No, okay. Uh, is this uh, available for us to use? So we're planning to open source it. We are actually working in a separate repository, working towards open sourcing all of this, but I don't want to like publicly announce a timeline. I'll leave it at that. Any other questions? Thanks a lot for uh, attending the talk.